Hi, this is Paul Wagner, and I want to welcome you to a cultural appreciation of wine, my class on the history of wine society and how all of that is tied together. I'm going to talk you through the sort of what you need to know to get started in this class, so let's dive right into it. Um, I will discuss five different things in this first lecture. First is just about the classwork and the grading, because I know that's important to some people. Um, I will also go through what kind of student participation is required for this class, because there is some student participation. Uh, then I'll, I'll go through the reading list. You are required to read three books for this class, so I'll talk through the books and explain how that works. And roughly go over the student learning objectives, just in case you're interested. And at the end, I'll give you a way to get a hold of me, so that you can ask me questions or give me any feedback that you'd like. So let's start with the classwork and grading. Um, you'll need to do basically seven things for this class. Uh, you'll need to read three books and write uh, papers on those books, and I will explain how that works. You'll need to cook three menus or three recipes um, if it is in preparation for one of the classes where we meet as a group uh, you may bring that food to class, but otherwise you'll eat it at home and talk to me about it. And then the final exam or final paper, we'll talk about that too. But the, the big issue for most people, or the big question that most people have, is about this reading. So, here's what I need after you read one of your books. I need three to five hundred words, and I need you to do three things in terms of the uh, of what you talk about in your paper. The first thing is show me that you've read the book. Now for example some of these books are also movies and what is interesting is that the movie and the book are very different and if you write me a report and you explain what you know about this and it turns out you watched the movie instead of read the book um, it's going to be a very different sort of story so read the book. Okay. Um, second, tell me why you think this book is included as part of the course. Uh, the, it should be pretty clear to you, but just give me an idea of that you understand what the relationship is between the book and the course. And then finally, to me, one of the things I, I, I want to stress this, um, some students have difficulty telling me this, but tell me what you liked and didn't like about the book. Uh, it may be that you don't like the book. It's okay. I'm not requiring you to like all these books. I'm just requiring you to read these books, okay? So, tell me what you like, didn't like, and then each one of those reports is worth 10% of your final grade. hope that's clear. Um, in terms of the menu meal preparations, we, if this is a live class, we will hold a series of dinners in class. Uh, if it is a remote learning situation, uh, you, I will ask you to cook a meal and, uh, or, or make a recipe from the appropriate time period and send me a photo of the meal and send me your notes on what it was like to cook it and what it was like to taste it. Um, we'll do four of these, a Roman meal, a medieval meal, a Renaissance meal, and a Victorian dinner. We'll also do a Greek symposium, uh, which is not a meal, but it's in fact a, a conversation about wine. And if we can meet in class, we will also do a Mesopotamian dinner. I will provide the food for that one and more adventure. So m my, my general rule is come prepared to get involved. Come prepared to think of wine and food as part of the same expression of society and culture. And uh, you, will, you will need to be um, ready to cook and ready to eat to do well in this class. Uh, one final note is the second to the last class, um, I will assign each one of you a, a legendary wine to research. So that will be, uh, that will be something that um, I think you'll look forward to. You'll really learn something wonderful about one of these magical wines. And then each of these, the, the three uh, meal menu preparations, is worth 5% of your final grade. So I hope that's clear. 30%, 10% for each book report, 45% because it's 15, uh, I'm sorry, let me try that again. 10% <laughs> for each book report gets you 30% of your grade. 5% for each meal preparation gives you another 15%. That gets you to 45%. Um, the additional wine gets you to 50%, and then the other half of your grade is the final. Final exam is a blue book essay exam. 
Uh, you need to bring your own blue book if we're doing it in class. There will be four questions and you can pick any two of those questions to answer and write me an essay. People always want to know well, how long should the essay be and I always say long enough for you to answer the question. I know that's a facile uh, answer but it's what I believe. Uh, if, you can pref if you prefer, if you really feel that you don't do well under the pressure of an examination, you can also write a thousand word paper on a topic that's agreed upon, but you need to get my approval before you do that. So maybe a month before the final is due, you and I should have at least a chat about what it is you're thinking of doing for your final project, and I can approve that, and then you can write a, a final paper on that. Doesn't have to be on a book. I've I've had a wide range of final projects for this class. I've had uh, projects that included a woman who found a diary of her great-great-grandfather who turned out to be a spirits salesman in what was then the Old West, and she wrote that up into a paper. I've had a student write a paper on uh, her family was Moroccan, and so she presented an entire paper on the food and cuisine of Morocco. Um, I've had people who say, I've always wanted to know about the wines of Alsace, so I want to do a paper on the wines of Alsace. Anything that captures your imagination, if that's what you want to do as a final paper, rather than take the exam, fair enough, go for it, uh, get it approved by me, and you're good to go. And of course, that is 50% of the final grade. Now, in terms of class participation, um, I am going to ask you to talk, to think, to share, to cook, and to drink in this class. Um, and what that means is every single class or every single year, this class is completely different because it depends so completely on the participation of the students. And, and each student body, each group of students, brings a completely different identity. One year I had four or five professional chefs in the class. The food was amazing and quite interesting and quite different. Another year I had, out of 23 students, I had 11 students from different countries. So all of a sudden we had a very international and very different kind of discussion than we'd had in years past. Another year I had people who were deeply involved in the wine industry. So everybody brings a perspective. Everybody brings expertise and part of the fun of this class is you sharing what you know what you do in your family and sharing it with the rest of the class because that's ultimately what this is about it's about the culture the history of society food and wine um, and the other thing I want to say is um, I, I'm, we're going to taste a lot of weird and different things this year. And the, the best way I know of explaining this is years ago, I took my family uh, on a trip to England. And we couldn't have afforded it except that we found a family that wanted to exchange houses with us. So we lived in a house in London for three weeks and they lived in a house in Napa for three weeks. And we were both delighted with the solution. But each day we would go to London and we'd go to a different museum. And one year we went to the National Portrait Gallery. Now, the two girls, my two daughters, were 11 and 14 maybe. They were preteen and teenagers. And of course, if you know anything about teenage girls, they are intensely focused on what they look like and, and what the world thinks of them. And so what I did when we got to the National Portrait Gallery, I knew this had the potential for being a really boring day for the girls. And so I said, listen, in each period of history, the people who were painted in this gallery were the most beautiful women and men of, of the world at the time. So what I want you to do is I want you to go through this museum and find the time period where you would have been one of the most beautiful people in the world. Because, of course, sometimes they had really high foreheads, sometimes they had large bosoms, sometimes they had small, sometimes they had big noses, sometimes they had small noses. And it was, a, it was just sort of a, uh, uh, what do you call it, a treasure hunt, a, a scavenger hunt for my daughters to find a little more interest in the National Portrait Gallery. But I tell the story because it's kind of the way I hope you will approach what we do in this class. We're going to taste the food of 5,000 years ago. We're going to taste what they eat in Greece. Uh, 
in Japan. We're going to taste wines that were made in the style of the ancient Romans. There's a lot of very strange things we're going to be putting in our mouths over the course of this semester. And I hope you will approach that with that sense of adventure that each time you try something, you'll think, gosh, this is different. And as such, I hope you'll get to the point where you'll think, hmm, if I'd lived in Rome, I would have loved it. Or if I lived in medieval Europe and had a lot of money, it would have been a great time to be alive. So I'm hoping that rather than looking at these foods and simply saying that's weird, I hope you'll also look at it as a way to discover what new flavor sensations and what new experiences you find really wonderful and that you'll incorporate in your own life going forward. Because at one point or another in human history, every single one of these recipes, every single one of these wines would have considered the best in the world. And your job is to find out which ones you like. Okay, let's talk about the reading list. Uh, you need to pick one of these books to read. And most of these are relatively easy to read. They're fun. They're adventures of people in another part of the world. A Year in Provence, pretty famous book. Peter Mayles is an advertising executive who buys a small place, uh, a, a farm, a farmhouse in Provence in southern France, and then discovers that all of his English acquaintances want to stop in at all hours of the day and night. But it's simply the story of him rebuilding his house when he lives in Provence and how he comes to grip with English culture uh, confronting French rural countryside culture. So that's the first book. Lots of fun. Uh, easy to read. A Small Place in Italy is a similar kind of book. Eric Newby was the travel editor for a major newspaper in Great Britain, uh, and he wrote this book. He was actually a Special Forces uh, agent during World War II, was dropped behind em enemy lines. He was captured. He escaped, uh, and the people up in the hills uh, of Italy uh, actually kept him alive, they protected him, they, they sheltered him, and when the war was over, he went back to thank them and eventually ended up marrying a young woman from that area. And even though they lived in England, they wanted to have, as an escape, a small place in Italy. It's beautifully written, um, but it's a very, it, it's not nearly as silly and fun as A Year in Provence. Uh, to me, it's more touching, it comes more from the heart, but you really need to decide which one you like. Decantations is by Frank Pryle. Frank Pryle was the wine writer for the New York Times for a generation. Um, very clever writer. This is not a book you're going to start to read and read straight through on a good afternoon. This is a collection of his articles that he wrote for the New York Times. So if you're the sort of person who likes to read five to ten pages before going to bed each night, this is a perfect book for you uh, because that's exactly what you can do with decantations. Uh, it's Again, it's not something though because each one of the stories is wildly different. Um, it's not something that builds to a climax climax or has a, th has a flow through it. It is just a selection of his columns, but he writes beautifully about wine and he writes beautifully about the people in wine. So important. Under the Tuscan Sun, you may have seen the movie. I will tell you that the movie and the book are so wildly different that the only thing they have in common are the Polish stonemasons. Um, but Frances Mays, uh, someone from San Francisco, she and her husband go to Tuscany and fall in love with Bramasole, the uh, small uh, uh, country home in Tuscany. And this is the story of how she rebuilds that home. So it's sort of the Italian version of A Year in Provence, although Frances is less funny about a life than Peter Mays is. She does a better job of capturing the food, and in fact, she provides a lot of recipes. So there comes times where you really just want to go out and buy some ingredients and start cooking when you read this book. Um, um, and uh, that's enough. You can, you can figure out which one of those you want to read. Notes from a seller book. Uh, Saintsbury Winery is actually named for the author of this book, and this man was one of the great wine collectors of 100, 150 years ago, and this is quite literally what it says. It's notes on the wines and uh, he drank and the foods he drank with them uh, from 150 years ago. You will be surprised at what the wines were and how different they are from the wines of uh, what we drink now. 
So it's a good little trip back in history. It gives you a very good idea of what life in Victorian England might have been like. Um, it's a little dry because it's just notes and comments about what he thinks of the wine. So again, not a, a novel, not even a travelogue, just notes. And then Tasting Pleasure by Jancis Robinson. <coughs> Excuse me, Jancis Robinson, uh, one of the first female uh, masters of wine, a real icon in the British wine industry. And this is really her story about how she grew into the world of wine. Um, some people find it self-centered, but to be fair, it's her, basically her wine autobiography. So it has every reason to be self-centered. And she does taste an awful lot of great wines. Uh, Vineyard Tales, Gerald Asher was the wine writer for Gourmet Magazine for a generation. Wonderful man, dear friend. Um, and he writes, basically, this is the same version of, of a wine book as Decantations by Frank Pryle. These are his stories about his travels uh, throughout the world of wine and what he experienced. Again, a really good book to read if you're the sort of person who likes to read, you know, one, one column per night. Uh, in a month, you'll have it done, and you, I, you'll really enjoy it. And then a season in Spain, uh, Larry and Ann Walker live right here in Marin County. Uh, um, again, dear friends of mine. And this is their story of spending not a full year, but part of a year in Spain, traveling around the country, experiencing different things. Um, it is not a definitive exploration of all f food and wine in Spain. It is simply the story of their journey over a few months around Spain to experience some of the things they love. A uh, lot of fun and, and again, really nicely written. So you have to pick one of those. Uh, you may want to read two of those, but you only have to pick one. Again, these are generally books about people visiting wine regions, okay? Next, you have to pick one of these as well. And these are more definitive books on a specific region. So Burgundy by Anthony Hansen, quite an old book, um, but gives you a very good idea of what the Burgundians think of themselves. Remember that Burgundy, like every wine region in the world, is constantly evolving. So this is probably a little out of date, but the writing is exceptional. The, the, the terroir, the Appalachians haven't changed, although some of the people certainly have. And it's really, really a good read and will give you a really solid foundation about in Burgundy. Simon Loftus wrote a, a lovely book about Poligny Montrachet, which of course is a small town in Burgundy. Um, and he writes just about uh, his life living there for one year. Uh, Jacqueline Friedrich wrote The Wine and Food of the Loire. If this doesn't make you want to go out and buy goat cheese, there is no hope for you. Um, it's a wonderful book about all of the various wines and foods that you find in the Loire Valley, a part of France that, frankly, most Americans don't know very much about, but in some ways has much more variety, actually in every way, has more variety than any of the more famous regions, whether they be Burgundy, Bordeaux, Alsace, um, Champagne, the Loire has, has way more variety of wines than any of those, uh, and it's quite a, quite a good book. Now we're getting into a couple of the really massive books. Uh, if any of you can actually make it through the entire six, seven, eight hundred pages of Bordeaux by Robert Parker. But if you've always wanted to know about Bordeaux, if you've always wanted to know what people think about it, uh, Robert Parker gives you everything you need to know, including a description of every single chateau you can possibly think of in Bordeaux. Now, I'm not going to suggest that you read the whole book. I'm going to suggest that you read the introduction and the overviews of the ver various regions. But I, this, is a, this is a reference book as much as a reading book. So read those introductions, read about the most important estates, but you do not need to know the, the assemblage, the vineyard makeup of the vineyard uh, that surrounds the Chateau of calan segur for example. And that's what this book is all about. But still, if you want to know about Bordeaux, this book tells you about Bordeaux. And then James Conaway has written two, maybe three books about Napa. This is his first book. Um, and if you haven't read it and you live in Napa, you probably should read it. 
uh, because it tells the story of so many of the people whom now are famous in the Napa Valley, but at the time, they weren't so famous. Uh, it tells you the backstory of some of the big names. Uh, it, it's again, it's four or five hundred pages worth of stuff. Uh, but if you live in the Napa Valley and you work in the Napa Valley wine industry, you should know this stuff. Uh, so I would recommend that book highly for anyone in this class. And then Vino Burton Anderson, The Real Authority on Italian Wine. Um, if you th would rather learn about Italy than to learn about, say, Burgundy or Bordeaux, this is your chance to take a stab at the thousands and thousands of wines in Italy as guided by Burton Anderson. So the goal of the first one is sort of a cultural experience in the region. The goal of the second group of wines is for you really to get into one specific region and feel like you have some real expertise in that region. Now the third you can also pick one of these. If there's one book that I might choose as being the inspiration for this class, it's probably Vintage, The Story of Wine by Hugh Johnson. We play a little more with food. We talk a little more about culture and society. But Hugh Johnson, a wonderful writer, master of wine, also writes wonderful gardening books. Uh, this, if, if, you, if you forced me to pick a textbook for this wine, it would be Vintage, The Story of Wine by Hugh Johnson. So it's a book you should have in your library, even if you don't read it. Uh, Hyams uh, wrote a book called Dionysus, which is about the ancient history of wine. It's a wonderful book. Uh, it's very hard to find. I donated one copy to the Napa Library, so that's a possible place where you could read this book. And The Wine and the Vine by Tim Unwin, the same kind of thing. A, a real story about the ancient roots of wine. Again, difficult to find. Again, I think I donated one copy of this to the Napa College Library, so if you really want to read it, that the advantage there. And then finally, the current um, expert on the history of ancient wine is Patrick McGovern from the University of Pennsylvania, someone I know quite well. Um, and he writes a rather academic, um, heavily documented, but very good book on the origins and ancient history of wine. And he l really gets into pot shards and tartaric acid crystals on the surface of the pot shards and all of this kind of stuff. So um, if you like that kind of scientific archaeological approach, that's the book for you. So you can use one of, you can read one of those. Now, the other thing is you can come to me and say, hey, I've been, I've read a bunch of stuff about this other book about wine. I'd like to read it instead. Suggest it to me. I will probably approve it because I'm all in favor of this. This class is not an exhibition of wine knowledge. It's an exploration and I want you to explore. So go explore stuff you're interested in. Bring me books that you'd like to read and we can add them to the list. Okay, student learning objectives. This is what you're supposed to get out of this class. You will demonstrate a knowledge of, and I'm going to read these. I apologize for that, but it's the way the college works. The cultural context of wine in historic and contemporary societies. In other words, what people thought about wine back 5,000 years ago and what people think about wine today and how those are connected. It may surprise you to know that one of the reasons I wanted to teach this class is I was reading a book about ancient Mesopotamia and I read a quote that was translated from the ancient cuneiform text back there, you know, the writing that sort of looks like chicken feet. And someone had roughly translated it, and I'm paraphrasing here, but it said, wine is a magical beverage, but the rich tr people get to drink all the good stuff. And that was 5,000, 6,000 years ago, and I thought, wow, times have not changed at all. Wouldn't it be fun to, write, to do a class on how people think about wine from back in that ancient chicken scratch writing, the cuneiform writing to today? So that's what gave birth to this class. Second thing is, I'm hoping to send you off in search of various subject matter. Um, I'm hoping to send you off searching recipes and stories about ancient wine. Uh, most of that's on the internet and you'll discover some wonderful sources for that, but you will discover those and learn how to use those. 
And then finally, technical writing skills. You will learn to write about wine. Uh, you'll learn to write about food. And we can build those skills as you turn in your papers and write your reports. So those are the learning objectives. I hope you sign on for them. I think they're, they're both modest and magnificent. And then the last part. Um, first of all, um, email. You can reach me at my Napa Valley College email, but if you want the email that zings right into my phone immediately, that's the pwagner at balzac.com. The Napa Valley College email, I have to make a special effort to go check, and so I check it once every day, two days, three days. So if there's something urgent, send me an email on the other email. Um, that phone number there is my cell phone. It rings straight through, and I never turn my cell phone off. So if you call me at 2 in the morning, I will know that you called me at 2 in the morning. Don't do that unless I am the only possible person who can solve a life or death emergency. On the other hand, you want to talk about something, zing me a text, ask me when would be a good time to talk. We can chat. I'm happy to set up any time pretty much uh, day or night to talk to you. I am retired. The r only real commitments I have um, are teaching at the college, so I have time. I'm happy to talk with my students. And then here's something that I think you'll find really valuable, which is I've created a website for this entire course. Um, that's the link to it, and if you if you click on that link, it will take you right to the website. Uh, the website has th the student learning objectives. It has the syllabus for the class. Uh, it has uh, a calendar of class lectures and notes. It has basically a summary of each of the lectures up as a lecture on the on the website, so that you can sort of follow through. Um, the lectures are more detailed and more involved than what's on the website, but at least those uh, those notes will give you an idea of how the whole thing works. So all of that right there, pretty much all you need is right there on the on the website and all you have to do is click on the links and wander around and explore hope this has been helpful to you uh, welcome to the class i'm delighted that you're with me and looking forward to continuing on and having a fabulous semester with you